And welcome back to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. Uh, my name is Avram Rosenzweig, and I'm really, really happy to be back here with you. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a really important show today. Um, I've been able to find some reporters in Israel who are very adept and very articulate, uh, adept at sharing with us what is going on in Israel today. Um, today, I'll be speaking with uh, my dear friend, Susie Stern Eklov, whom I've known for many, many years. She's a Torontonian, made Aliyah a number of years ago. And most recently, she went on a mission down south um, to see what had happened uh, on October 7th. There's a phrase in, in Hebrew, it's edut, or a word in Hebrew, it's called edut, which means being witness. And we often do that when it comes to the Holocaust. Nowadays, since October 7th, many, many people have traveled south in order to be witness uh, for us, for Jews and non-Jews all over the world, to let us know exactly what's going on or what happened there and uh, what we can do to make Israel stronger and to make our world stronger. So firstly, let me welcome uh, Susie. How are you? Hey, Avram. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm happy that you're with us. And I must say that Susie is very tenacious. Uh, you're very bold and you go out into the world. And I think that you really, truly try hard to to be a witness to what's going on in the Jewish world, in particular in Israel. And I commend you for that, Susie. Thank well done. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are we are privy to a lot of anti-Semitism in the world. Uh, there was a post that I saw on the weekend uh, here in Toronto on a TTC stand or stop, which is the transit. It's our bus system. And it says this, these buses do not carry Jews and call us bastards. Um, we haven't seen that sort of, uh, uh, those sort of epitaphs in, in many, many years, but they are more ubiquitous than ever before. Um, it's extremely uncomfortable for many people to see such things. And my first response is, you know, to hell with you guys, who's ever writing us. I mean, firstly, I, I find that they have no idea what a beautiful people we are, and they have no idea about our strengths and what we brought to the world. So my heart goes out to those people who are just full of hate. And secondly, my second thought is, you know what? We are a strong people. We are a unified people in particular nowadays. And uh, we have the ability and we have the tools to fight such nonsense. And we are. So, Susie, you being in Israel, being from Toronto, but living there, would you say that you're aware of anti-Semitism in the world? Well, can I can I back up a little bit yeah. if it's OK? So you knew my parents. And yes. um, so my parents were both Holocaust survivors. And I'm on the young end of, uh, most people have grandparents who are Holocaust survivors, but I actually, both of my parents were Holocaust survivors. And um, so I always grew up with this feeling that, you know, there isn't, there can be an undercurrent of anti-Semitism underneath the ground. And, you know, when the when the when the time is right, when the when it's a perfect storm or whatever it is, it can it can just pop up, and I feel like we're seeing that, you know, now all over the world, and it's being framed as you know, like anti-Zionism is is a politically correct anti-Semitism, which is something that I've been feeling for many 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 years. Um, you know, I wish I had been proven wrong, honestly, but, um, you know, I just want to say that as the daughter of survivors, I'm particularly sensitive to, I, to, to anti-Semitism. You made Aliyah when? We made Aliyah four and a half years ago, six months before COVID. Yeah. And you have five children, right? Yeah. I have five kids. Um, three who live in Israel and are married and I have four grandchildren here and I have a married son in Toronto um, and another son who just finished physiotherapy in Scotland and he's going back to Toronto soon. So you're a booby. 
I'm Safta. <laughs> You're yeah. Safta. How does that feel? It feels great. It feels it? great. Yeah. I, yeah. It feels There's an old bumper sticker that says, if I knew that being a grandparent was so great, I would have done it first, right? <laughs> so you, you moved to Israel and you're there with your, your, your lovely husband and uh, children and now grandchildren. Uh, what is it that you do in Israel? How do you spend your time? Let's give mm. people a sense of who you are. How do I spend my time? Okay. I'm a life coach. So I do some life coaching and I, I really spend a lot of time learning. I love to learn. I was, I, all year last year, I learned at Matan. I mean, we moved here. I did all pun. I improved my Hebrew and then Corona started. So for two years, I, um, without any guilt, sat behind a computer. I took a life coaching cert certification course. Um, I wrote 12 storybooks huh? that I have to edit and, and publish that teach the tools of life coaching. Cause I think everybody could benefit from life coaching tools that they could use in their own life to improve relationships. Um, I did a year and a half long course on Jewish meditation, teaching Jewish meditation. Uh, I took a course in crystals from a Jewish perspective, Jewish numerology, and I spent the last year uh, studying at Matan in um, in Ranana. We have a, there's a beautiful center here. There's classes every day. Matan, um, Matan is what? Matan is what? Matan is a women's uh, learning center, and they have they have them all over Israel. Um, and uh, and then this year, I, I sort of wanted to launch into some kind of work, and then the war started, and I guess and, and I got. I got frozen. I, I just got completely um, paralyzed. And, How so? And I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, the, the war started and probably like a lot of people in Toronto can relate to this and, and Israel. Um, you know, I, I just spent a lot of time sitting on the on the couch scrolling, scrolling through the phone. Like, you know, on the one hand, I felt like I needed to be a witness to what was happening and I needed to post. I'm very, a very prolific poster, as you know, um, you know, share. I felt like it was my job to share and post and share and post. But I, I, um, you know, if I didn't get up and get out and go and do something, I, I could literally feel paralyzed, like not knowing what to do first. And I could turn around and half the day had, had gone and I had just been on the phone feeling like I needed to do that. Do you feel like a newcomer there still? And is your response different than Vatikim, than veterans who have been living in Israel all or most of their lives? Do people respond to you as a newcomer? Like I remember when I was in Israel and people would say, ah, dea, you don't know, you weren't in the Tzava, you weren't in the army. You have no idea what it's like to be an Israeli. Looks like we lost Susie. Sometimes that happens with Wi-Fi in Israel. And we are hoping to get her back. I just want to remind our listeners that uh, we are talking to Susie uh, Stern Ekloff, uh, an individual who made Aliyah from Toronto. And I'm trying to do more of this uh, since October 7th. And that is, you know, speak to Israelis. Um, be, the, be the end of it. Welcome back. Be the <laughs> individuals who, who, who recently made Aliyah uh, okay. who, or who people have been living there for a long time. So today we're okay. delighted to have Susie Stern Eklov with us. Uh, sometimes things are going to cut out because I think it's the Wi-Fi in Israel. <laughs> Susie thinks it's the Wi-Fi in blame Canada. Blame Israel, of course. Blame <laughs> Israel. <laughs> <laughs> but Susie, how, how do people respond to you there? Let's say since October 7th. Is there a sense of way to go? You're here. Thank you so much for coming. Or okay. you simply don't understand the real sort of energy of what's happening there. Okay, so this is this is an amazing question. Thank you for asking. So first of all, what I wanted to say was I joined this trip because I, I saw it being advertised and I felt like it would be a way to break me out of my um, paralysis of not really knowing what to do. And I felt like I really needed to get on a bus, be with other women, um, and you know go around the country and like i needed i needed a wake up i just needed to wake myself up because i was kind of feeling very s stuck and lost um and do the israelis feel biyahad with you do they feel so, like yeah, so that's, what, that's what i want to say so the trip was um 
the trip was a beautiful um, merging of, there was American and Canadian women. There were Israeli women, Israeli women like me. So there were women who've been here for 30 years and 20 years and, and five years, um, all who have either sons or sons-in-laws in the army. And they also had Israeli Israelis, like born in Israel Israelis, popping in and popping out on the trip. And it was, it was incredible. Um, it was just beautiful. So um, I speak a pretty decent Hebrew. I came here when I was 18 and I learned to speak Hebrew and I, I my Hebrews, I have a lot, make a lot of mistakes, but it's pretty okay. And one of the things that I, one of the first things that happened was we stayed in this hotel and the hotel, a beautiful hotel. And the hotel had 200 mefunim. Mefunim are evacuees. People who on October, on October 8th were, or 7th were taken out of their homes and they went to hotels and they, some of them have been there for four months with their children. And so, you know, at breakfast, I'd walk around and I'd smile at people. They'd invite me to sit, sit with them and talk to them. And, and we got to know each other. We shared phone numbers at the end. So I find like people are, are very happy to talk to me. And I, I think that that might even just be a bigger change maybe since October 7th. I feel like there's this, you know, weaving together of a new fabric. Like, you know, you go to these hotels and people are not in their homes. So they're with this whole new cohort of people, people from the right, people from the left, people from the north, people from the south, people that they never would have met before. And then there's these um, smiling Americans or North Americans or Olim Chadashim who come and do workshops with them and donate things and bring things. And it's almost like everybody's like, you know what, we're all in this together. And, and, and they want to, and they're forming new relationships with each other and with the new people who show up. And I think it's incredible. I, I think what's fascinating is, is that tragedy can bring people together. There are studies that were done on American uh, as soldiers during Second World War, and they asked them after, after the war, what were your feelings about you know, being together with all these soldiers, you know, meeting so many new people from different parts of the country overseas? They said it was the greatest time in our life. Uh, that's, yeah. that's difficult. It's difficult for us to, to understand those who have not been at war. But what they're saying is the camaraderie is so rich and so great. So I have this image of you being down south in that hotel, sitting down with those Israelis. And I can imagine like an Israeli babuj, a woman like a booby grabbing you and kissing you and say, thank you so much for being here. Is that is that a reality? Well, I, I think what's happening right now, honestly, in the Jewish world, you correct me, I'm here in Israel, you're there in Toronto. I think people are are looking at their Jewish identity and they're looking yeah. at their Judaism and they're going like, who am I? Like, like what 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 is this Judaism? Like, what is this um, this legacy that I've been born into? Like, you know, and and thinking about their identity. So one of the things for Israelis is when they see North American people donating and coming and wanting to be a part of, of them and wanting to help and like, what can we do? What can we do? How can we help you? You know, or or me, I made Aliyah. I came to Israel because I, I felt like this is where, from the first time I came here, I felt that this is where my soul belongs. This yes. is, this is who I am. And I cried for 35 years until I finally, until my husband and I finally got to move here. So I think for people that gives them a lot of chizuk, that gives them a lot of strength um, to know that like they really are part of something greater than themselves. They really are part of a nation that care about one another. You know, Su Susie, historically or sociologically, when people are put upon, very often what happens is they integrate the anger that other people are um, have toward them. Do the Israelis have a woe is me attitude at all? It's like, damn, the whole world hates us, you know? Not the whole world. That would be inappropriate to say. That's wrong. We do have friends. But so many people hate us, and these people are attacking us. Uh, 
it's so hard to be a Jew. Is that there that, do you get that sense at all? I mean, I think, I, I, I think that many people are, are shocked. I, I think people think like it's 2004, look how far we've come in the world, you know, like, like we have, you know, we're doing meditation and mindfulness and we've got this, you know, consciousness and the whole, you know, me too movement and, and like, and the whole, whatever, like, you know, you, everything's acceptable, everything, you know, whatever. And, but not us, <laughs> not like, it's like, it's like, it's good for everybody, but it's not, not for us. Like, it's just like, and what is that? And I think, I think people are shocked. I think a lot of people feel like the rug's been pulled out from under their feet. I mean, I know, I know, I know some Israelis who now live in Canada and I, and when this happened and the world started, um, you know, making signs like rallies, rallies against the Jews or not speaking out about, about Jewish women being raped, all, like they really, they really felt like the rug was pulled out for under, from under their feet. Like, like their whole picture of who they were got smashed and, and, and they don't know how to put it back together again. Um, so I would say that those are some people. And I think other people um, here are, I guess everybody comes from a different perspective. You know, I would say yes. for the people who always thought, you know, we can make peace. We just have to be nice. We have to, you know, be kind. I think that they're really having an existential crisis or they've really shifted and said, this is what I've always thought. This is how I led my life. This is, these are the values that I was always going for. And I realize it's not, it's not the case. I, I did, there's a video that maybe you'll play later on um, with this man that I met in Kfar Aza. He worked for Yediot Ahronot, which is uh, um, a big newspaper here and Gal Galatz, and his daughter was murdered in Kfar Aza Kibbutz. And he says, you know, I raised my my kids. I taught them that they needed to behave with derech eretz. They needed to be nice. They needed to be good. He goes, and now I realized that that wasn't enough. I needed also to tell them that there is evil and you have to know how to recognize evil and you have to know how to stand up, how to stand up against it. So I think that there's a big paradigm shift. Um, the women that I spoke to in the, in the uh, hotels, they said to me, our society is never going to be the same. Like, you know, a lot of things are shifting in people's, in the reality of what, of what people are realizing. Um, you know, and of course in Israel, you've got those, you know, I mean, I think everyone's trying to figure out, like there's definitely like, we want to finish this war. We want to finish Hamas. We want, we want to be able to have safe borders so that people can go back to their homes. Yes. Yes. And, even yesterday, there were rockets shot toward the south. So, I mean, people don't want to stand for that. And yet, on the other hand, we have this whole hostage crisis. We we met I last week. I heard Rachel Poland speak. Actually, you can't really see it, but I'm wearing. Today is 150 days that her son's been in in captivity. Um, he had his know, arm blew off, right? His arm yeah, was blown his arm off. Blew off. You know, they, they, and then we met another um, woman um, and she was telling us about her son. And she was like, uh, like some of these people are just beyond, you can't even understand. She said, my son Omer is coming home. I visualize him. I know he's coming home. I visualize him walking through the door. I smell the schnitzel that I'm cooking for him. I feel his hugging. Like she's really using the tools of manifestation and positive visualization and she's like i know he's alive and i know he's coming home so there's also that whole hostage thing so there's a lot of things that are kind of tearing israelis apart that way um but really like for me the only focus is Ahdu, being together togetherness finding what unites us and this trip showed me so much of what unites us and 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 the boots on the ground of of incredible things that people people are doing here, Susie. I I grew up in Kitchener, Ontario, which is about an hour west of Toronto. 
And just as a little fellow, I actually experienced anti-Semitism early on. My father was the orth- an Orthodox rabbi in Kitchener, so we were identifiably Jewish. Yeah, I mean, I've so- told the story many times, but after kindergarten, I told my father, I'm not wearing my keep at school anymore. This is at, I was six years old, because uh, these guys would chase me at lunchtime and they hurl these anti-Semitic epitaphs at me, and it was just too scary for me. Um, I, I know what anti-Semitism is and I've seen it. And I think there are an awful lot of Jews who have. Um, but I think that when October 7th happened, uh, there was, uh, sort of a, a, a new perspective on anti-Semitism that for sure diaspora Jews, young diaspora Jews had not witnessed before and probably did not know about. Um, it's pretty bad. And I think that unless, you know, you're somewhere in a hole, you can't help but see that, boy, oh boy, there's a lot of hatred out there directed at our mere 15 million people. There's That's how many Jews there are in the world. Why do you think we're hated so much? Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's a hard question. You need to get Dennis Prager on here. <laughs> I'm happy um, to have Susie Stern on here. So, <laughs> so tell me, why do you think we're hated I don't so know. much? I mean... I think this, I mean, okay, here's me and you on a Zoom call right now in 2004. So I think we're just, we're just people in history that have, that, that go all the way as far back as, you know, like, like the fights with the brothers, you know, with, with, with Asav and, and yeah, Jacob. Like, I think, I think we're, I think it's, I think we're just a continuum in history. Like, I think we're maybe, you know, I mean, if you look at, if you look at Jewish history, this, okay, I'm just going to say this. Okay. My mother-in-law and I used to always have these conversations. She's Canadian, born in Canada. And like, really like anti-Semitism was like, not like, she would always tell me that I was kind of, you know, like I'm imagining it, whatever. So like I said, I wish I would have been wrong, you know? Um, and she called me a little while ago and she said, you know, I, I just want to say like, you were always very sensitive to anti-Semitism." And she goes like, you know, I'm sorry, but um, yeah, you know, you're right. Um, if, you, if you look at the book by Dana Horn, People Love Dead Jews, have you ever, have you read that book? It's I have not, book. but I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read, read it. it, no. Everyone should read it. So it's almost like a history of Jewish communities that pop up all over the world and get wiped out for one thing or the other. So like, you know, we're wiped out because we're poor, we're wiped out because we're rich, we're wiped out because we don't have a country, we're wiped out because we do have a country. Like, you know, it, it's 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 all these thousands of years of history. Um, you know, it's like, it, it, it's not, it's not new. And I, and the other thing is, I think that there's oh, another it's definitely thing. not new. Yeah, correct. It's definitely yeah. not new. I think That's we, tol- I think we tolerate a lot. I think we, I think we tolerate, you know, like the, um, the frog in the pot where you, it, it gets into the pot and then you turn the heat up a little bit and it gets comfortable and you turn the heat up a little bit and it gets comfortable. So I think that, you know, we sort of like, okay, we can deal with this. We can deal with that. I mean, even we can deal with rockets being shot into the South. Like how, how did we tolerate that? We can deal with one or two people getting picked off by terrorists. You know, how is it that we tolerate that? How is it that when I went to university, after I left university, there started to be this Jewish apartheid week and we tolerated that. So like we, I think we just kind of tolerate little bits and little bits and little bits and little bits. And and suddenly like the pot is boiling. You know, what's fun. You know, what's phenomenal, Susie, is that I've been on TikTok and other sites, social media outlets, and there's a lot of vile stuff that comes my way, right? Really deep, ugly. Oh, we lost her again. I'm sure we're going to pick her up, pick up, pick up Susie in a second. Um, I just want to just say that. The phenomenal thing about anti-Semites is that they maintain that we are victimizing ourselves. There she is. She's back. 
I never went What's anywhere. With, <laughs> <laughs> What's up with Israeli Wi-Fi? Uh, um, you know, Susie, I was saying that, you know, no matter what we say, you know, about October 7th, about the Holocaust, about the time and time again when we were thrown out of England and France and Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The anti-Semite today says, and they've told me this time and time again, you are victimizing yourselves, right? That's you Jews. You do that all the time. You turn yourselves into victims. I go, wait a second. So 6 million people are murdered. So 1,200 people are massacred on October 7th. Aren't we victims of violence uh, and of awful behavior? But they have a really hard time with that. What do you think of that? I mean, I think they've done studies where they show that, you know, being a, a trauma survivor actually shows up in your DNA. Like in my DNA, there is evidence of the trauma that my parents suffered yeah. in the Holocaust. And I gave that trauma survivorness over to my kids too. Have so, you seen it? Have you seen yourself doing that? Seen myself behaving. In other words, when you were raising your, when you were raising your children, did you see any behavior within yourself of, uh, of being a victim of the, the terrible things that we went through, your parents went through during the Holocaust? <sighs> oh, Avram, I, I'll be honest. Like my whole identity growing up in Toronto, and I guess if anybody's watching this that grew up with Holocaust survivor parents, my whole identity personally was mm -hmm. that of being a um, child of survivors. Mm -hmm. Um so, so for me, yeah, and my, my identity was being a child of survivors. Then I came to Israel when I was 18 and I saw Israel and I'm like, oh my gosh, like there's a land, there's a people, there's soldiers, there's strong people, there's music, there's all this incredible creation, there's this look at all what we've planted, what we've built. And I'm like, like if I, I like, I like to use this metaphor. If you ever played trivial pursuit, you know, you get this like pie yes. and then you fill in different parts of the pie. Yes. So being a survivor was my first part of the pie. Coming to Israel was my next part of the pie. Then when I came home from Israel, when I was 19, I wanted to learn more about Judaism. So I started to study at York University and then I came to Israel and I learned here and then I could add this religious piece of the pie to my, to my Jewish identity. So, um, but in the back of my mind, is there sort of like this victim consciousness? I don't know. I just feel like I'm always... I was always tapped into this. Um, I don't believe it wasn't there. I don't know. Like as a coach, do we create, do we manifest that which we, but I mean, I don't know. I don't think my brother feels, felt like a victim growing up. He's married to a non-Jewish woman. And I don't think that that was his experience. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I just see as a father. You know, I've, I've been telling myself for many years, thank God my son is 17 years old, almost 18. And I've been telling myself for many years, uh, you know what? I've worked through a lot of my shit and I've dropped a lot of the stuff that uh, were, was imposed upon me through my parents, you know. And then one day I started to realize, wait, 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 hold on a second. <laughs> you have your own stuff, you know, and you are passing that on to your son. So whichever way you slice it. Uh, I think generation to generation, we're going to share the beautiful stuff. And very often we're going to, you know, cut away the stuff that we did not work with us from our parents, but inevitably, and I think you're saying this actually, inevitably, we're going to share with our kids the stuff that is somewhat toxic. That's just the way it goes. Yeah. Right. Cause that's who you are. Right. Yeah, like that's I right. That's know, right. You know, God gave us kids when we were young. Right. Like when you're 24 or 27 or whatever, have you worked through all your stuff? You're just figuring out that you have stuff, you know, and you're it's trying true. to figure out where to go. And then suddenly you have kids and you're thrown into like, you know, the most wonderful time of your life. But there's a lot of uh, survival mode in parenting, right? You know, 
earning a living, having lots of little kids, trying to get everyone places for carpool, you know, rules, regulations, not knowing what to do. And um, because there's no manuals. There's no manuals. And I was raised by, again, two Holocaust survivors who were taken from their home when they were 14. So they didn't really have even uh, role models of parenting. I can only imagine and feel sorry for them um, and and admire them for how they did the best that they could with major trauma. I'm I'm sure today my father would have been diagnosed with PTSD. You know, um, well, they raised the lovely daughter, Susie. Thank you, thank you, Susie. Thank you. I, I want I want to head into the mission. Yes. Now, the, let let me just sort of set this up here, and then you dive right in. Um, it's a it was a woman's mission, and it was a couple weeks back. Uh, it was, no, no, no. I just came back yesterday. Oh, I okay. I'm sorry. Sunday was okay, the final. Okay, okay. You came hold home, on, and then you went back. Oh, well, hold, hold on one sec. So you went you went down south, and this was all inspired by De- Deanie Cooper Smith who is a Torontonian herself. She made Aliyah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and she created this entity, which is called Women's uh, Reconnect Trip, which is a beautiful idea of bringing together women of all backgrounds, right? And mm-hmm. in this case, traveling down south to various different destinations and seeing what happened October 7th, talking to some of the victims there, parents, and so on, and then acting as witnesses. The key word here is a dude. Mm-hmm. Right. So that we, the Jewish people and non-Jews throughout the world should understand, hey, this is what happened. This is what we were witness to. And you need to know this because it's a terrible, awful thing and it should never happen again. Mm-hmm. So we're going to take this sort of day by day. Okay. Um, tell us what happened on the Monday that you went south. Where did you go and what were your activities that day? Okay, so the Monday uh, evening, we all met together, and I think we said this, that it was a beautiful mixture of um, women who have sons and sons-in-laws in in the army and women who came from America and Canada. Um, We went to the, we met at the hotel, and and I just want to say if it's okay, you know, when I was thinking about going on the trip, like I know that there's a lot of missions coming here and um, I kind of wondered, like, is it really okay to go? Like, isn't it kind of like voyeurism, like going and seeing like, you know, why do we want to see these horrible things? And my husband even called me to the last minute. He goes, you know, so you you don't have to, you really don't have to go. This might not be good for you. I mean, you know, I'm a particularly sensitive person and I like absorb everything. And he's like, you know, maybe you don't want to go. And this trip really, I decided to go and this trip really changed my mind. Um, So I'm really, really uh, glad that I went. So as I said, we started off in this beautiful hotel and like we get to the hotel and I'm like, oh my God, how can I be staying in this beautiful hotel? It's like so spoiled. There's people, you know, how can I enjoy such a thing? And then like you start seeing these little kids skateboarding and you're like, oh, there's evacuees here. Right, <laughs> so it's right. like, yeah, I can be here and they're here and we can we can inhabit this space together. Um, it, it, it's, it's called it's called the Kadma Hotel, right? The Kadma Hotel. Kadma Hotel. And it's a total twist on being in a luxury, gorgeous hotel with 200 evacuees. Yeah, what was that like going into a stunning hotel with hundreds and hundreds of people there who cannot be in their homes? What was that like? Yeah, it was really um it was like a it's like it was like a cognitive dissonance, you know? It was like like two incongru- incongruous things. But I don't know, like I guess that's what's happening. It's like a like a creation of something new. I mean, I've seen all these videos. I don't know if other people like see on Facebook. They had they had a video I saw recently of people leaving this gorgeous hotel and the mefunim, the evacuees, um, put on a whole evening for the staff. Mm-hmm. And they 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 made awards and they had them sit in sit down and they did all kinds of things to show gratitude for the staff because really people found themselves thrown in 
together, like in this pot, you know, in a pressure cooker and, and really like trying to, to, to show love and express goodness to one another. Uh, I guess what so I'm trying that to was like what my I'm... big. Oh, and I want to share one other thing about the hotel. We had, um, sorry. Oops. Can I share one? No, other no, thing no. About finish the hotel? and uh, fin fi finish, and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. Okay. Um, we spoke to some some of the we had uh, one woman um, from South come and tell us how much. And this is why I want to give a shout out to everybody who's watching this who's a donor. They, she was telling us how they were so grateful um, for the donations. Like one person said, you know, we left our homes. It was summer. We ran out with a, with a bag. Like we didn't take our stuff with us. We didn't think we were going to be outside of our homes for four months. She said it like winter came. They didn't have warm clothing. And people have been donating all kinds of, you know, like all the things that you hear, soap, shampoo, underwear, sweaters, clothing, jackets. Um, and then another woman was telling us that the kids were like going out of their minds. Imagine kids, there's no school until they yeah. figured out what they were doing. They're living, some of them are living like whole families in one room, you know, and you've got little kids. So one woman said one day somebody rolled up with a trailer full of bicycles and it's actually really funny because I live in Renana and right across from me is a synagogue. And when October 7th happened, people started dropping off all kinds of things. And the 16 year olds were in charge of it. They were packing the boxes. And one day I saw like hundreds of bicycles outside and someone said, yeah, we're, we got donations for bicycles. We're taking them to all the kids who were in the, in the hotels. So this woman said one day, this trailer full of bicycles showed up and she said, and I wanted to thank somebody. So I called the person who brought it and the person who brought it said, don't thank me. I'm just the delivery person. <laughs> and she's like, well, who told you to deliver the bicycles? Yes. And so he gave her a number and she called that person. And he's like, no, don't, don't, don't call me. I'm just the bicycle store. I, I got an order and you know, so she said, who gave you that number? And she, she kept calling all the way. And she's like, I couldn't find who to thank. I want to thank people. Uh, what a wonderful all story. Things. It's unbelievable what's going on here. The generosity, the people from outside of Israel and from inside of Israel. It's it's just incredible. It's really That's special. a wonderful, Sue, that's a wonderful story. I'm sure a lot of people will repeat that story. It, it sounds like a, a, a song from the Agata for Passover. Yeah. A God, yeah, sort of song, right? Don't <laughs> thank me, <laughs> thank bye. him. No, don't thank me, <laughs> right? So, so Susie, you're you're in the Kadma Hotel. It's an exquisite hotel. A shout out to them. Anybody who travels to the South, use oh, the Kadma Hotel beautiful. facilities. Kolakavo to them as well as many, many other hotels throughout Israel. Were you uh, rubbing elbows with victims of October 7th, direct victims, someone, people who had lost somebody, their children? Uh, well, we did, we did, um, we did meet with uh, the people that we met in Kfar Aza, you know, the man that lost his daughter and I shouldn't say lost, his daughter was murdered. Yes. And, we had a we had another meeting with um, a woman. I, I mentioned uh, her son is Omer, and she's visualizing him coming back. We met with we met with uh, people whose husbands had driven down to the Nova Festival to try to save people. We met somebody whose whose husband saved like twenty people. Um, so so yeah. I, you know, you have this picture back there. I don't know if people can see that picture. Yeah, I want to jump to Tuesday. We just finished okay. Monday night. Tuesday, okay. you're, you're picking fruits. Yeah, so we're picking fruits. So I want to tell you a beautiful story, uh, two, two stories about picking fruits. So um, first of all, one of the, when we got there, you know, we're like 25 women. We got there and um the man whose orchard it was, wait, just quick backup, you know that all the foreign workers left after October 7th. So there's been like a huge pressure on Israeli farmers. They have no one to help them plant their fields, pick their fruits. So there's a, a ton of WhatsApp groups that I'm on and people are like, 
you know, can someone come to this field on this day? We need five volunteers this day. We need, there's just the, the, the mobilization of Israelis is like, it's just not to be believed. Anyway, so how, so long, we, how long were you picking fruits for? So we picked fruits for an hour, but this for is what hour. I want to tell you. I know it doesn't sound like a big deal and no. it's not, <laughs> but this is, this is a beautiful, a beautiful thing that the guy said when we got there. He said, these are my, my orange fields. Um, and he said, I want to tell you a story that my grandmother told me when I was, when I was a little boy, he said, one shekel plus one shekel plus one shekel plus one shekel. If you keep one shekel and another shekel and another shekel and another shekel, eventually you'll have a million dollars. And he goes, and it's the same with the. I'm sure she's going to be back. I can't wait till the end of the story. <laughs> Susie's a fine storyteller. And I'm just sitting here on Spilka's wondering what happens after the four, uh, the, the four shekels or the four dollars. I'm sure she'll be back in a moment. This does happen sometimes with Israel. <clears throat> I've had it a few times and it, and it makes for a challenging interview. But we are Jews and we will hang in there. You caught me. Uh, I lost welcome. you lost me at the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I blamed Israel again. Okay, so one shekel plus one shekel plus one shekel plus one shekel. Go ahead. Go and ahead. it's the same with the grapefruits. He says one grapefruit and another grapefruit and another grapefruit and another yeah. grapefruit. He said, and eventually the grapefruits will be picked. So I took a picture of all the grapefruits we picked in an hour. One grapefruit and another grapefruit. And you know what? Um, there's two things I want to say. I really feel like... I've noticed, I've met a few people who've come to Israel to volunteer. And it's really interesting. When I was 19, I came to kibbutz to volunteer, 18. I came to kibbutz to volunteer and to do things that no Canadian girl did, like bag bananas on banana fields and, you know, all the things that, you know, have this feeling of being a a chalutza, a pioneer. A pioneer. And I find that what's really cool is people are coming to Israel, they're reconnecting with the land, they're getting their hands dirty, they're making a difference, they're picking a grapefruit, one grapefruit and another grapefruit, and another. They're, they're pitching in. And I feel like it's this, this rebirth of a reconnection to the land that, that we've lost, especially, you know, because of these. And also, maybe we've taken Israel for granted, you know, maybe like, we think, okay, Israel's there, so I can come whenever I want to come. But it's like, you know, Israel needs you now. Like, it, need, it needs you to come pick clementines and to bag, to bag strawberries or, or whatever. Um, my cousin just came for three weeks, and he worked um, at Leket for a week, you know, solid every day for three shifts, doing whatever they told him to do. I know another... Um, who recently came for three weeks and he had his knapsack and he was going every morning where it was needed. Um, there's groups called Hotel Brigade and people come and they do all kinds of things in hotels, whatever, making, you know, you know um, Marcy Rapp from Toronto? Yes. She does jewelry yeah. making workshops and people go and they do music, mosaics and they, they do massages for, 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 for the women. Like, like there's so many ways to make a difference right now. And, and, and it's not just making a difference. Like I said, weaving this new fabric together between people, which I think is so beautiful. Love, love uh, said in a lovely way, you know, the Chalutznikim of old, the pioneers said that we, the Jewish people will be a true people. We'll be, you know, have a true nation when you'll see Jewish street cleaners and you indeed you'll see Jewish farmers and so on. And I remember when I came to Israel in 1978, I went to Yeshiva and I saw people on the electrical wires, you know, wearing kippot and their tzitzis were hanging out. And it struck me, indeed, this is this is truly a Jewish nation. Now, I want to ask you a question only for my own edification. Okay. What instructions did the farmer give you <laughs> in terms of picking the grapefruits? Is it you pull it off the tree and put it in a basket? Is that it or yeah, what? Yeah, he didn't really give us, like, I knew, because I had been on a kibbutz, I yeah. knew that when you pick citrus, you're supposed to twist it. <laughs> oh, you are, are you? 
I did know that. <laughs> well, why? 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 Why know. twist it? Do you know why? No, I don't know. I don't know why. Well, it just pops off. It pops off easily when you twist it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you did this. You know, Susie, you're telling wonderful stories. Good for you. Um, you. We're going to head into Wednesday of your trip. I'm going to see if we can start okay. with this video. With this video see. here, just 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 listen to this video, and then then Susie will tell you what we're watching. Listen to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, I'm Shimon El Kavetz. I'm Sivan father. Sivan murder here. Uh, at Brotoli. Uh, and I want to thank you that you come because every eyes, every heart uh, that, that see the, the evil. You go to your community, to your child, to your place, and tell the world what they done to us. Tell the, tell the world what they done to us, what they done to our children, that, that they are do nothing. They put them from the bad and murder them. And we're going to tell the story. Thank you. And we're going to honor Sivan. And we're going to do a part. Thank you. Thank you. So, Susie, when you sent me this, I started to sob. I started to cry. And, and what happened in my head, and tell me if this is what happened to you, as I thought, I, I, I thought of my own 17-year-old son. And, you know, I'm here, and he's safe, thank God. And that man was living in the South with his family, and his daughter was taken from him and brutally murdered. And I thought, as a parent, to suffer that, it's overwhelming. It's just overwhelming. Tell, tell us about that man and that day. So that's Kfar Aza, and um, Kfar Aza um, was broken into in the fence, and the first place they went to in in Kibbutzim, they have an area that the that the young people, like the eighteen to twenty one or twenty whatever, sort of like dorm, like it's not dorms, like everyone has their own room with a little kitchenette and a bedroom and a little living space. And that's, they were closest to the gate. And um, I mean, the devastation, it, it, I mean, you just stand there and you, you can't believe, like you can't believe, like bullet holes, everything's destroyed, black. You can see where they wrench their way into the, like into the locks of someone's home. The wind, like just the whole thing is, um, you know, you know when you watch like Lord of the Rings and you see the monsters from from the underworld come up and destroy and and burn and and murder everyone in sight like that's what you're looking at. And um this man I don't know if I said this before if I did I apologize I'll just say it again. He he's like a famous journalist. Um Yeah, you mentioned it. Yeah people on the trip that like stopped and hugged him and they said to us you don't know who this man is he's a famous famous journalist and um so his daughter and her boyfriend were murdered the morning of october 7th and his that room is the only like little house that you can go into her sivan her home and her mother created sort of like um an exhibition she took pictures of how the house was found there's pictures you know of blood-stained shoes and there's and and there's she on the wall there's um a picture of the texts that they were sending back and forth like the daughter sent them a text is something going on like do you hear something and and you know and the father's like uh, you know like just this horrible conversation. Um, it, by the way, at the end of this interview, if anybody wants to see like the full, um, you go to my Facebook page because I, I documented it all and 
and I and I read the whole thing. Um, and she's got pictures like, you know, and then in the back of the room, you can hear the mother's voice going, I came to your room just to see what's here. And I opened up your drawer and look, there's a copy of Judy Bloom and there's and there's there's you know the Tanakh that you got on your on for your bat mitzvah and 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 it's heartbreaking and and like we said what can we do and he said i want you to be our witness you have to be our witness go back to your communities tell people what you saw here be an aid and you know, one of the things we learned on the way down to Kfar Aza, there, there was a lot of Torah learning that kind of really helped. I think going on a trip like this, I think you need to have some safety. And we, we went with a, a beautiful woman, Chaya Kaplan Lester, who is, um, she's, a, psycho, she's a, a psychotherapist and she deals with trauma. And she also learns and teaches Chassidut and Kabbalah. So she gave us a lot of beautiful Torah. And one of the things is Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. So apparently the first word of Shema, the last letter, the Ayin is large. And Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. The last word Echad, the Dalid is large. And the Ayin and the Dalid together make up the word mm. aid. So I think that, you know, that's our model. And aid, and, and, and aid means witness. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Aid means witness. Yeah, that that's the punchline. Aid means witness. Um, so Shema, hear Israel, you know, like that is our our mantra, like listen and, and be a witness for other people. And, there, and there's God in that. And then there's the oneness, like it's all one. And, you know, being a witness for somebody else is part of my connecting to the one of our people and to the one person. Also, like the one plus one plus one plus one grapefruits, like there's a power in one. We each have this tremendous power to create a unity and a unification for for the world and our people. You are a marvelous storyteller, Susie. <laughs> Thank you. You are. You're marvelous. I have a question for you about our people, at least our Israeli brothers and sisters. I'm thinking as you tell us the situation of how the mother took pictures and you could hear her voice in the background. Here is your Judy Bloom book. Here is the Tanakh you received for your bat mitzvah. I'm wondering to myself, is that what Jews do when we go through a trauma immediately? One would think that they have to go through the various different procedures in order to help with their post-traumatic stress, which I'm sure they have. Um, but here they are setting up, if you will, museums, uh, remembrance, memorials to those who were lost. Did, did you find that strange at all? Or did that make total sense that they jumped well, into action right away? So one of the things that I've noticed here, which is such a testament to the people and is so incredible Oh, there's such a creativity as a response to trauma. When people are murdered yeah. here, the first thing they do is they run out and they build. They write songs. They create exhibits. Like if you go to Hostage Square, there's we actually had this woman come who did who did the Butterfly Museum. Um, if it's okay, if I if I I'm going to continue this answer, I can I can talk about. Um, about about Thursday, yeah. Tell us about we, Thursday. Sure. Where we went to um, the Nova Festival. So you go. We we went to the Nova Festival. So what did they set up in the Nova Festival? Like, please go to my Facebook page. You'll see. Every they have a whole um, a whole area where they put each for each person who was murdered. There's a picture of the person. And there's like people bring rocks and they bring candles and, and you walk around and you look at everybody's, everybody's faces and there's, and, and there's art and there's, and then there were these people who came, hundreds of people with guitars and, and they stood in a giant circle singing 
like, you know, you're, you're in this place that is going to be so depressing, but you're so uplifted because you see that the response to like these horrific atrocities is like, we're, we're going to respond with song and music. And, and there was people like with their arms around each other, you know, singing Achenu and Ani Mamin and all these like harmonies. That's what it is. Harmonies uniting through songs and, and harmony, harmonizing voices. And I'm standing there looking at this and like, you know, there's all this death around me and all this art and monuments. And they planted a whole field of trees, each on, um, on Tubishvat. Each family came and planted a tree for their child and the name of the child is there and they write about, you know, um, there's so much I want to say. You know, one of the things that's crazy in the Holocaust, there's so many people who died nameless and faceless. You know, I have one picture of my grandmother, one picture of my grandfather. I don't have pictures of my father's siblings, you know, and here um, we have so much information and history and knowledge of people who were who were killed, and um, you know, and you can you can really relate to them. And in the background, and wandering around, you hear boom, boom, like there's all these all these. You can hear you can hear the war going on right behind you, and helicopter. And it, it's just such a position of, of, of everything together. So I think that the, that the Israeli response to tragedy is to build and to create. Yeah, I, I just want to leave this point sort of floating and perhaps people can respond to it. Uh, we lost Susie again to Israel Wi-Fi. We'll get her back in a second. I think the thing that, that I'm finding uh, difficult to understand and I think Susie is, is, is sort of positioning this in such a way that this is Israeli mourning, that Israeli mourning is to be creative and to build memorials and to sing and to dance, um, to remember the tragedies, to remember the atrocities. I'm just wondering is, you know, most people who go through such things, welcome Wait. back, Susie. Most, most, wanna... people who, most people who go through such things, they would fall into a depression. They would fall into a deep sadness. And uh, what I'm wondering is, does that come later? Does that not come at all? Um, is that totally replaced by this creativity? It's just something that I want to leave out, leave out there because I'm having a difficult, as a Canadian Jew, I'm having a difficult time understanding this dancing and the singing in light of the absolute, absolute horror that occurred there. So, um, yeah, I'll leave that out there. Susie, I... I want... Yeah, you want you want to talk to one that more for a thing. I do want to finish with one more thing about um, creation and and response. So after the Nova Festival, we went to a place that was maybe like the highlight of the trip. It was called Shuva Brothers, and it's a rest stop. So apparently, on October seventh, um, when information started coming in about uh, what's going, what was going on civilians who lived in the area um, from uh, a place, a community called Nativot, they got, they just mobilized. They literally like, they went out to the fields with flashlights and helped helicopters land. And they created this rep rest stop where volunteers come and cook meals and busloads of soldiers get brought in to go to the washroom, to reload on, um, on things that they need, protein bars and and cigarettes are a big thing, and and warm clothes and food and coffee and there's music and 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 it's all created, um, it's all funded and created and you know by by people from within Israel and without Israel and that's I think what I want to add about the response. You know, what happened here right after the war happened was everybody mobilized. They created WhatsApp groups. They started initiatives. They started finding out we need to cook for 300 soldiers. We need to cook for 100 soldiers. We need challahs. We want to do hafrashat challah, like bake challahs. We want to, like, you, 
but we're collecting stuff like you could feel in the air and that's a form that is creativity you know it doesn't have to just be music but but the 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 um impetus to get up and do something yeah, yeah. to make yourself count and that is that is what this country is all about. And that is, I think, the greatness um, of our of our people. Oh, it's I magnificent. Think. I think I'm projecting here because I knew if Chas Khalila I went through such tragedy, I know myself, I would go into bed. <laughs> and well, I wouldn't come people, out I wouldn't come out for days, you know. Plenty of people plenty of people do. Plenty of people yeah. did. I'm telling you, I got I was frozen at the beginning. I was literally, literally frozen. Frozen. I didn't know if I was coming or going. But then you know, but then stuff happens. Like, you know, your son gets called your son. My son-in-laws, two son-in-laws were called to Milui. My daughter has a little baby and she got a job and she needed someone to help her. What so, is Milui? Uh, what is that Milui? Oh, sorry. Okay. So basically what happened here was, you know, they needed a lot of people to fight. They needed a lot of people. Don't forget also, like we're talking now, there's, there's, there's stuff going on in the North. Like the people in the north can't go back to their homes. There's, you know, a looming war on the northern border. And they needed massive quantities of people that they that they had never had before. So Miluim um, are men who were or and women who were once in the army and you know they're normal, they have normal day jobs, but they got called up to go. Um, I would say my one of my son-in-laws. Zach Fox. I'm just giving a shout out to you, Zach. He, go, Zach. Um, the young guys, they like fought to get in to be able to help. And um, so my son-in-law went north. My other son-in-law went south. So Miluim Nakim, they could be people from 60 or 70 or 30 or whatever. And they leave their jobs and they leave their families and they go and and go and fight and then there's the 18 to you know 21 year olds or however old 20 whatever that are in regular um army that's called sadir um and then there's people who have who are career army people who've signed up for longer that's called keba so um anyways so yeah so so we all had to we all had to get into action no matter what it is one of my daughters um, she started an initiative with another friend. Once a week, they cooked um, a week's worth of meals. Shout out to my daughter, Shira Kishitsky. Um, they um, cooked meals for wives of families whose husbands were in war. Because just imagine, you know, you could have one, two, three, four, five, however many kids, and your husband's gone. And number one, you're worried, you know, when they go into certain places in Gaza, they take their phones away. They can't speak to their husbands. They don't know if their husbands are okay. So this affected like every layer of, you know, from grandmothers who were doing whatever grandmother duty, you know, mothers, um, you know, wives, like absolutely everybody was affected and everybody tried to pitch in to see, you know, where they could be of service. Susie, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, you went home for Shabbat. You went back down on Sunday just to wrap up this interview mm -hmm. today, which by the way, has been magnificent. Thank you. You've done a terrific job. Thank um, you for being such a great question asker. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm a good question asker. You're right. Um, <laughs> you, you, uh, you. <laughs> I like, I like how you said that. You, you, you listened to Rabbi uh, Leo D. Rabbi Leo D. was an uh, is an individual whose wife and two daughters were killed by terrorists uh, by in a terrorist attack last year. Boy, oh boy! I mean, here is another example of somebody who steps up during trauma or through trauma to uh, play a role in helping Israel heal and rebuild. What, what was it like listening to him, knowing what he's gone through? That's unbelievable. You know, when, when Leo D's wife and two daughters were murdered on their way up north to a uh, Passover vacation last year, 
um, I watched there, I watched the funeral live stream and I, I cried like a baby. Talk about feeling depressed. Like I couldn't move for, for days after that. Um, and it's unbelievable. Some of these people that it's like, you look at them and you go they're they have this level of greatness and maybe they had this level of greatness before but their child was killed or their wife and children were killed and you would ex it would be perfectly normal to crawl into bed and never want to get out like that would be a normal response and um and you see this unbelievable greatness like he's flying all around the world working with students, talking to students, um, you know, trying to help fight anti-Semitism. Um, you know, like you look at somebody like a Rachel Polin, bring hope, bring Hirsch home. Um, she, she's like this articulate, incredible human being that like her son was kidnapped and now she is like this face of you know, you look at these people and you go, like, I don't know how you, like, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you take this raw material that is so difficult and so hard and you, and you transform it into yes. something that is so inspiring. I mean, they're hurting. I just pray that they're, you know, that I pray that Hirsch comes home. I, I pray that Rabbi D, you know, I mean, his wife and two daughters are, are gone. I just pray for blessings for him and I just pray for our people really and I I pray that we should have achdut which is unity and we should we should just really weave into a beautiful tapestry of of togetherness and goodness and I just want to say about this trip also by the way going on this trip was a way to process all of the pain that all of us have been experiencing together and being a deep being witnesses for one another and and processing things together we can't fix it but we can contribute we can do we can come into action we can share with one another and we can be witnesses to one another well one of the reasons that i i've never gone on march of the living is because I don't want to find myself walking on the tracks of Auschwitz and to be totally conscious and aware of where I'm at and what occurred um, underneath my feet. I, I don't want that because emotionally I'm just not that stable. <laughs> and, 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 and I think if I had full awareness and con consciousness of what happened there, the murder, the death, the violence, that it would not augur well for, for me. You mentioned before that you know you absorb everything. What was the outcome of this trip? Um, in terms of your own response, were you okay afterward? Well, my outcome of this trip was sending you a message and saying, Avram, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm yeah. ready to be interviewed. I have to share what happened on this trip. Yes, you I did. have to, I promise to be a witness and, and whatever platform I can use to be a witness. So thank you for allowing me to share this um, and being, being a witness for you know the mother of Omer and being a witness for Sivan, for her father who asked us to be a witness, and for the beautiful soldiers. We met so many beautiful soldiers who who are so grateful and they know what they're fighting for. Um, and so that's one thing. Another thing I'm just gonna leave you with is that I also never um I also never did March of the Living. I've always wanted to go do a trip um, to go to Poland and Czechoslovakia and see where my my parents came from and to witness to witness that destruction. And the funny thing is, when I was six years old, I used or maybe eight, I used to have this dream that I would be interviewed on a talk show, and that um, my message would be. Um, as a child of survivors, you know, I, I saw myself sitting at this round table with all these talk show hosts and I would say, you know, we don't have to like each other. We don't have to love each other. We don't, we don't have to agree with each other, but we must all agree to live and let live. That was my message. 
And I was never on a talk show, so I guess maybe this is the talk show. <laughs> so yeah, can, this is your dream. Yeah. This is my, talk, my dream come true is to be on the Upper Rosenzweig show. <laughs> <laughs> here you are. And here I am. But, um, you know, it's funny. So I always thought that my my uh, shlichut, my, my mission in life was to um, be a bridge from the Holocaust to this generation. Like I said, I am the younger, like all the Holocaust survivors are dying. And, you know, I'm still, I'm almost, I'm almost 60. Um, so, you know, like I'm still on the younger end. But now this happened and I'm like, oh my God, I am a bridge between the Holocaust and this. Like, like the Holocaust is part of me, a deep part of me. And now this is a part of me. Oops, connection lost. Are you still there? I can still hear you. I can still hear you though. Keep going. Hello there, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes. Can I, hear I can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me. You can hear me. Susie, Anyways, I so I, you know, I don't know. You can hear me now. So I don't. I don't know what what. I'm like really trying to figure out where my, my place is going to be. Well, I, I will tell you, Susie, I, I will tell you in, in completion here. <clears throat> and I'm not saying this because we are old friends. I'm saying this because I truly believe it. You really did a wonderful job here today. And, and you did because you're highly articulate and you're a very, very, you're superlative storyteller. So you, you were able to bring all of your experience together and express them in a way that trust me, a lot of people who have been listening to this and will listen to it are going to repeat your stories. They're going mm. to be out there. So if you're asking yourself whether you're an aide, whether you're a witness or not, you are. And I am uh, very deeply honored to have had this thank opportunity you. with you. So thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And really like it's, it's not, it's really not about me. I just want to know how, how I can be of service, how I can, you know, how I can help. I guess God gives everybody their bag of, of um, tools that they can use to do good in the world. And I absolutely, I really just want to do good in the world. That's really all I want to do. See. And I really just want to be a witness for those people who, who said that that's what they need. That's what they want. Susie Stern Eklov has been my guest today. I'm my number two reporter in Israel. And you can mm -hmm. find her on Facebook if you would like uh, to see more of the videos that she has taken, if you need more information, you'd like to be in touch with her, let me know and I can hook you up with her. I do want to repeat and I do every single video after uh, every single show after October 7th, become involved, play a role, right? Uh, in the healing and the rebuilding of the Jewish people, because we have to, because we have no choice. The Jewish people are such that we love one another. We take care of one another. We need to do so. Find a place within these times where you can use your talents, your skills, your gift, your neshama, your soul uh, to make us even stronger. What's magnificent about our people is that in the worst of times, mm -hmm. when we are being paraded out of countries in the 14th century, there is still Torah, which is being created right? There are still ideas that people are sharing. There are books that be, that are being published. There is something about the Jewish people that has that within our nature, that has that within our spirit. And I think that Susie touched on it so beautifully when she talked about the Nova Festival and what she saw there today. So uh, we've lost her again to Israeli uh, Wi-Fi. I don't think it's mine. <laughs> and I want to thank her very much again. She did a beautiful, beautiful job. I'm Yisrael Chai. The nation of Israel lives. I look forward to being with you again very soon. Play a role in the healing and the rebuilding of Israel and the Jewish people. We are a wonderful, magnificent, magnificent people. I'm Yisrael Chai.